Welcome everybody who's joined us this morning um, for the first of our TTF Insights series. Um, this is an incredibly important place for us to have started the insights process with the business events and business travel industries. Um, this is going to be a vital part of the recovery of the Australian industry. In fact, without these events and without the promise of the kind of activity that they represent, the industry recovery will be that much slower. So we're particularly thrilled today to have a wonderful panel. Uh, Peter King, who's the Chief Executive of the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. Uh, Lynn Lewis-Smith, who's Chief Executive Officer of Business Events Sydney. And Penny Lyon, who's Executive General Manager of Events from Tourism Australia. Thank you all, one and all, for joining us. Thanks, Maggie. Pleasure, Maggie. So, welcome. Let's talk about what I think is going to be core to the recovery, and that's the industries you, you all represent. Now, everybody's taken a massive hit out of the coronavirus. Just how much has it impacted on your business, and how long... Do you think, and look, you know, I feel free to whip out the crystal ball. Um, how long do you think it's going to take to get back to normal? Let's start with you, Lynn. Okay. Wow. Um, big opening question. Uh, it, it's had an enormous, well, it's catastrophic for the industry. There's no doubt. $36 billion will be lost this year from um, not being able to host business events. And, you know, my heart goes out to the industry. About 92,000 people have lost their jobs. And, you know, it's, uh, it's devastating. We've, we've never seen anything like this before. I think, you know, I talked to one of my industry colleagues about how many crises we've been through previously, but, um, and we've rebounded back and our, our industry has been incredibly resilient. But this time is different. It's very different. And I think our landscape um, will change forever. In terms of business events, Sydney or B Sydney, we um, only have operated in the international market since the ICC was rebuilt in Darling Harbour. So it's had a, um, a huge effect on, on our business. But in saying that, um, to give hope, there's, you know, we've won 11 bids this year. So there's still clients out there in the international marketplace that are hopeful that our borders will open. Um, but, you know, our assumptions are possibly middle of next year. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But, you know, we've rehomed. I think the industry's rehomed, you know, 96%. Um, of the business that were confirmed for this year into 2021 and beyond. So that's, that's a good result. Um, in terms of how the market's going to rebound, I think this is going to be really interesting. Obviously, it will follow the consumer market, and Penny will probably um, speak more to this, but it'll be intrastate first and foremost in getting our venues open. And the Prime Minister came through with phase one, two and three. We're not actually in either of or any of those phases. So it'll be post July, I think. Um, and then we talk about the trans, it'll be interstate next and then the trans Tasman bubble. And then internationally, I think it's gonna be interesting. Australia's handled this incredibly well. So we'll be looked upon as a safe destination to come. It's just which countries will open up to each other first and foremost. And I think um, if it's country to country, it'll be corporate meetings and movements like that first but i think we're a long term long time of maybe global meetings where delegates come from a hundred destinations um so it's going to be slow and easy all right peter peter over to you um yeah well it's uh times have changed obviously if you're sitting here um, with these permanently fixed uh, headphones on these days it seems to be the way that we operate but um yeah look in our case, we've gone from a business that was, uh, you know, about to have its best year ever um, to uh, zero revenues um, overnight. We, were, we, we closed our venue uh, very early on completely. Um, and, you know, we had a, we've got a thousand people who are basically working at their optimum. Um, we had business as usual occupying over 100% of our time. We were so busy. Um, and then all of a sudden now, in the last um, eight or nine weeks, we've um, we've now got 100% of our available time of, um, I guess, to prepare for the future. So it's a, uh, you know, we, we were trying to um, open capacity for innovation previously, and we just didn't seem to have the time. All of a sudden, now we've got 
all the time in the world to consider what the future looks like. So, and, and look, we've spent the last eight or nine weeks. I, I can't believe that you can shut a venue and be busier than when it's open. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to the day when we can actually get back to doing business again. Um, but it's been an incredibly sort of intense and unrelenting um, process over the last few weeks. And, and really a lot of it's just been about looking after our people, trying to give them some sort of comfort and surety uh, for the future. Um, so that's taken an enormous amount of time working with our government. Um, and I must say the government in Victoria has been in, incredibly responsive and, uh, and supportive of, of our businesses and a lot of other businesses too. So, but look, we've postponed an enormous amount of business. Um, we have had obviously a, quite a few cancellations through that process, but um, you know, I guess when we first started, when we first hit this, the, the evidence was that you go into a pandemic and you have a, a, a massive crash, but then you come out of it really quickly. Um, I think that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's not going to happen in, in our industry. And that's what we're grappling with at the moment is what is the, what does the crystal ball look like and how quickly is the rebuild going to be in the various segments as Lynn was just, just referring to. And look, I, I don't know, you know, it, it could take us three years to get back to where we were um, from a revenue perspective, but I've got no doubt that it won't be business as usual and it, and the revenue that we generate in three years from now will not be the same revenues that were generated in the same ways six or eight weeks ago. So that's, that's the challenge for the, for the business as to how, how quickly we can come out and, and exactly what the makeup of our future uh, revenue base is going to look like. Terrific. And I'm going to come back to that innovation point in a minute. Um, Penny, you know, Really fascinating times for Tourism Australia across the board, you know, really interesting change in role for you guys. But how are you seeing this and what are you seeing as a bit of a global perspective on what might be happening with these business events? Sadly, everything that Lynn and Peter have just talked about um, is, you know, the global status. Um, you know, I think I was reflecting yesterday, I've been in the industry for 30 years and I think our industry has... Um, always tackled, um, you know, crises or just issues um, in, in um, you know, regular um, ways that they sort of come to us, whether it's at corporate level or these sort of bigger crises. And the industry has always been absolutely fantastic at dealing with them. I think it's an industry that's agile and solution driven and so on. But, um, yeah, the world and the business events world right now is very much in um, the most um, similar place it's ever been. Um, we're seeing, well, we've seen 70% of cancellations of international business, um, many of which is obviously postponing, but we're also starting to see a pattern with some of the international association events who um, will cancel because they don't want to mess with their um, event cycles and what they've confirmed for future destinations over the next um, few years. So there's certainly been an impact there. But um, look, every one of our key markets, and we're speaking to our um, stakeholders, um, not just in Australia, but obviously our key members and key customers overseas on a very regular basis, they're all saying exactly the same thing. It's, you know, everyone's wanting to get their business, um, you know, in check. They're looking after their customers first and foremost and looking at how they can postpone and rehome events. So it is Survival 101. Um, but exactly as Lynn said, there is also a little bit of light. There are people who are quoting. We're still getting applications in for the bid fund. Um, and some of our teams in market, in particular in China, are chomping at the bit about getting back into um, our standard distribution activities. So we have to be mindful of that, of course, because our borders aren't open, but um, it really is, um, you know, a, a, a timing situation of checking in, a sensitive situation of checking in and just making sure that um, not just our um, customers overseas are um, doing okay and that we, we are checking in with them, but our Australian industry are also doing okay too. So mm. our business actually being very busy at the moment focusing on so all those can I, can I just come back to this future vision with all of you in terms of what we've already got in the can over the coming couple of years anyway and just unpick what that's going to look like the things that are still confirmed because they're a you know a, a way off and if I could just say to um our uh 
attendees, please feel free to put your questions in. I can see the questions and I will be asking the panel. So thank you very much. And in fact, I'm going to start just this conversation about the future um, of the no, in other words, the bookings you currently have, um, with a question that has come through and starts with a bit of a congratulations to Business Event Sydney in terms of those 11 bids. Some curiosity about what year's there for and for all of you as well. And Peter, I'll come back to you to talk about what you've got on the ticket for the, for the upcoming. But um, do we anticipate that delegate numbers from international are going to be what they were actually anticipated when the bid commenced, even if the event is, say, two, three years away. So, Lynn, I might start with you. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's a great question because we're all asking that question. Um, what does the future of these meetings look like? I think um, for corporate meetings and corporate incentives, you know, we will see smaller numbers. There is no doubt, but we'll still see um, movements into Australia when the borders do open. I think the biggest change with the corporate meetings will be the hybrid. I mean, a lot of corporations like Salesforce and Cisco have worked out that they can reach millions of people with that um, technology enabler to, to reach um, right across the world, but host an event of a smaller number. In terms of international events and the bids that we're winning at the moment, they are smaller in number, um, and I do think, like I said before, it's going to be challenging for them to predict what those numbers will be right now, given that the borders aren't open and the world's not open to travel at the moment. So is it restricted to those delegates just coming from where the borders do open first, and then the hybrid model steps in, which I think will be the new normal going forward. People of associations have recognised that they can reach a larger audience and and so i think that's going to be the the difference um, smaller regional meetings and you know if we get back to the big five thousand ten thousand i'm not quite sure i think to pete's peter's point it'll be three to five years mm. peter over to you i'd be interested to hear what you've got on the forward ticket that you feel is solid it's going to stick and what the implications of the change process are going to look like in terms of delegates and other issues um, look, we've got a really great pipeline, but um, I'm highly sceptical of the, um, you know, the ability of some of these um, events to uh, to still be able to be conducted. It's, you know, <clears throat> and it is ultimately all in the timing. Um, we, we as a as a venue business, I mean, historically all we've done is sell space. Um, up until probably uh, you know recent years, where we've started to obviously add in the food and beverage experience and, and the incredible technology that we can apply to events now as well. But I think going forward, we're going to be more involved, more and more involved in, in the assistance of content development um, and the, the whole event experience enhancement. Um, and that includes hybrid events, virtual, virtual elements into the event. So technology is going to pay, play an enormous part in that. But in saying that, you know, we've got some real challenges in, in coming up with protocols around COVID safety. Um, we need to provide an environment where, where our delegates and our visitors are, are feeling safe. And that involves, you know, everything from sanitization to temperature te checking to, um, you know, tracing apps, um, um, all sorts of cleaning regimes that we've never had to deal with before. These are, these are going to be significant costs that are added on to the the the, um, the cost of events. Um, there's uh, you know additional security. There's all those sort of things, and then there's just the pure distancing, the social distancing issues around um, you know a 250 seat uh, um, auditorium will probably turn into about a, a 30 person auditorium if you if you're basing it up upon about a 15 percent re, uh, return on the, if you if you apply the social distancing rule. So. You know, we've got some real challenges as we come out of this to ha how to best manage and, and ultimately to give confidence to people to want to meet face to face again. And that's, that's going to be the, uh, the real challenge, I think, for our business. We, we have enormous pent up demand. Um, we've, got, we've got some uh, big exhibition organisers ch chomping at the bit to have their, you know, their business conducted in September and October this year. Um, if we can if we can work with government to allow us, because we, we are controlling these events, they are not mass events. Um, they're not concerts or sporting events. We, we do know the delegates and we know who's turning up. 
and we have to get the protocols in place to manage that. Mm. If we can get a couple of those up, you know, in through that September and October period, that'd be enormous. Um, the, the challenge is if we don't, we're running into November and December and January, which is historically very, very quiet for business events. And we won't come out of this until April, May next year. So, you know, there's, there's a bit of pressure on us, I think, to try and at least get some events up and give us some confidence that the business events industry is back in action and, and can be seen as a real driver of the recovery from a government perspective. Margaret, can I just add to that? I think um, we have a real opportunity in Australia right now in terms of technology and to Peter's point, you know, the protocols in place. But I, I heard this morning that lanyards are being made with detectors of, to, you know, are you 1.5 metres? If not, you're going to glow. Um, temperature checks in convention centres where you just put your wrist up. I mean, this is a real opportunity for R&D and the government and industry to come together to create technology-based um, advanced manufacturing applications and sell to the world. I think, you know, our industry can really step up to the plate here. Mm. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, Penny, can I ask you a sort of slight twist on the, the question around, um, you know, what those uh, international attendances are going to look like? I mean... In terms of flexibility around the bid fund, given that it's going to be almost impossible to estimate at times what the international take-up for conferences is going to be, do you see some greater flexibility in how that bid process is, is managed because of those changes? Oh, it's something we're talking about at the moment, Margie. I mean, we've only got one year left of the bid fund program and, you know, the industry um, convention bureaus and centres have really, um, you know, they've used it well over the last couple of years, but you know, um, we've got these 12 months to um, continue spending the money. Um, and with the bid still coming in at the moment, I just checked off four um, yesterday. So they're still there. But um, look, for us, it's um, a really important um, activity. And um, it's going to be a hyper competitive world out in the world of business events um, as things start to return. So the bid fund is absolutely critical too to what we do and continue to do to position Australia. Mm. So, sorry, Peter, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's keep moving along then. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> um, from, from your point of view, do you think that, and, and I'm going to ask you, Peter, about this, since you didn't have a, any extra comment on this, but I'm going to ask you about this. Um, you know, can domestic conferences uh, fill the gap in the short term? I mean, is there enough work that's actually been postponed over the last four or five months that's moved into a later part of next year or whatever else? Will it fill the gap? Or is there a need to create a new species and style of events domestically to try and um, fill those industry venues and also to provide something important to, to the business community, of course? <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, probably two parts to that question. I suppose the um, uh, domestic business is is incredibly important to us. It's a, um, international is about 15% of our business and uh, in Melbourne, and it's, inc it's very uh, important from a political perspective and from a yield perspective, and, it, um, you know, it, and it's, it, it fills a, a, long dist a long distance pipeline. So it's, we'll work really closely with our, with our bureau who are doing a great job down here to develop um, you know, longer term international prospects. Um, so that still remains incredibly important, but the domestic business, um, we will need to look at different segments, I think. Um, and this is the challenge of our, of our industry because we, you know, we've got big venues um, to fill. And if we, can't, um, if we can't be relevant in the communication and the face-to-face -face communication, then you know, we, we, um, we're gonna, our business model is gonna struggle. So we're, uh, we're lucky in the sense at the moment, we, we're setting up, a, a, we're just relaunching our business in the sense that we're, we're putting a, a filter process through our organization, looking at a whole lot of new ideas about what the future is going to look like. Um, because we know that business as usual is not going to cut it. And, uh, and we, we have an opportunity, a very rare opportunity to actually reset our business uh, to make it uh, applicable to the future. Now the, the futures, that's the hardest part is identifying what those opportunities will be. But I think it's all those things you're just talking about then around the use of technology, 
um, the different experiences that we can provide for people to get together. Um, I think government is incredibly important here that every government is looking at recovery um, activity. What are we going to do to recover quickly? Um, how do we create jobs quickly? And I think we need to be aligning ourselves as an industry very closely to the initiatives that governments are putting into place around recovery and what do they look like? And how do, you know, the, the bottom line is we bring people together. We connect people, our industry. So how do we best connect all of the recovery initiatives that the governments are going to be working so hard on and investing so much in? And I think there's a, there's a real opportunity of alignment there um, if we can understand where they're, where they're seeing their challenges and how can we facilitate that conversation uh, and get people together to, to lead us out of this recovery. And so I think, I think the mix of our business is going to be very, very different to what it was. Um, we, had a, we had a beautiful business. It was very predictable. We had you know two or three years of pipeline locked away. We had all of our staff knowing exactly what their roles were on a day-to-day -day basis. That has been completely thrown upside down now and, and we're going to need different skills in our business, different capabilities and different customers and different revenues and different partnerships. And I think um, that's going to be the challenge for us. But as an industry, we need to build that confidence to ensure that people can come together um, in a face-to-face -face situation with, with confidence and safety. Yeah, it's absolutely right. It's a people industry. I mean, Lynn, from your point of view, you, you spoke a little bit before about hybrid. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? Because that's sort of what Peter's talking about here in terms of how the business is going to change and what it looks like and what sort of new markets you think might emerge as part of that changed world. Yeah, I mean, we're still crystal balling, there's no doubt. <laughs> I think... Um, Walk on know, the wild hybrid. side, Lynn. Walk <laughs> on the wild side. <laughs> um, I think technology is fast tracked, you know, um, where we had hybrid meetings before and this industry has been talking about, you know, technology replacing face to face. I don't think that will ever happen, but it certainly um, heightened the need um, for us to be on the front foot. I think it's an opportunity for Australia again to be a world leader in this. And when for government, we need to fast track that NBN. So these sort of platforms are seamless. Um, and give clients the opportunity to, to beam, you know, their content to the world. Um, in saying that, you've got time zone issues as well. So that's a, a complication that we're going to have to work through. Um, different, you know, for the domestic market, interesting being um, just in the international, and we have a diversified strategy. Um, I think, you know, the direct sell market, Penny, as you know, has been our, our biggest growth sector for the last decade. You know, are they going to go online? Is the client going to go direct to consumer where, it, you know, the distributors are, um, are no longer? And is that going to you know, sort of replace the face-to-face -face big gatherings that we've seen? Probably not. I think um, that face-to-face -face and selling is going to be more predominant in China and, and throughout Asia, but the technology will creep in over time. So that market may change um, slightly in the short term and maybe significantly in the next decade. Uh, corporate meetings, again, you know, I think... Um, the technology-based ones are really advanced in this space and we're going to see more of that. And then I've, I've touched on the international associations. Um, what I think will be interesting from our perspective as B Sydney entering into the domestic market, we've always been there, but it's an opportunity for us to build a technology platform because the event planner is going to have very different needs and wants. Um, and how do we connect that up with the supply chain? How do we through technology, bring the client um, to engage with our strategic partners and our members, our, our visitor economy supply chain. It's a real opportunity for us. And I think the other opportunity is inaugural events. Let's look at where we want to position Australia on the world stage and how do we put that business and innovation top of mind in a new event that we might create? And I think government and industry will invest in those types of events. And that's a bit of a protectionism um, approach if you like but I think there's an opportunity for us to build a base for when the markets open up um, to attract international buyers as well. 
I'm going to come back to that unique event piece in a moment, but I just want to go to some of the questions that are coming from the attendees. And there's an interesting one here about, you know, we're an island. I'm going to send this one to you first, Penny. You know, we're an island nation uh, and, you know, we've done a good job with COVID-19. I think it's added material to our brand value and as a desirable destination in so many different ways. But to keep that and to make sure that we are as safe as you can be in that space, what happens if we don't open our borders until later than we actually think is possible and other countries open and they potentially get the jump on us from, a, you know, an event attraction perspective? You know, how do we recover from that? And is the, the whole safe destination thing going to be enough of an addition to our brand to make it possible for us to, you know, make up the distance if we're later into the market? Mm -hmm. the, safe destination, the safe destination thing is always a tricky one. I mean, in, um, we often talk in the business about whether or not that's something we can promote. I mean, we're a marketing agency, but um, safety and security, um, as I often have, you know, say to the team, it's, you know, just one nut job running down the street that can ruin that for our country. So, you know, we can't claim that as a, as a marketing position, but um, I think we can absolutely talk about how um, Australia has handled this. Will it actually do the job of selling events? Will it do the job of us recovering quickly, particularly if other destinations are open before us? Probably not, but the, what we'll always fall back on is our, you know, unique selling points. And Australia is an incredibly um, open environment where our natural landscapes and our clean skies and, and our um, cities that aren't as populated as other parts of the world will be unique selling points that we can certainly rely on. But also because the business events industry in Australia is really, really well known around the world for doing um, brilliant business events. It's been a really strong proof point for us. Um, we've used that over the years and we'll continue to use that. So with some of the ideas that um, Peter and Lynn have talked about earlier, if we can really get on the front foot with that and position Australia as having very good understanding of um, customers' sensitivities, um, then absolutely we'll go, um, you know, and and um, promote those those things. But I must say, look, there's an absolute um, appetite within the executive team at Tourism Australia and our board and the minister that, you know, it is a high yield business um, sector that business events is incredibly important. And we're using this time at the moment to look at recovery opportunities. And, you know, how do we keep the dreaming alive with the business event planners around the world, both for the association sector and for the incentive sector, um, just to make sure that, you know, they don't forget about us. We have not gone dark in any of our marketing um, in business events. And if we can continue to promote, you know, the things that we've talked about over the years, we've got this incredibly beautiful country. So we always promote the beauty and the unique selling points there, but also the innovation piece, you know, the brains um, of what we can offer. And, and together we'll continue to do that and work with industry to do that overseas um, to make sure that Australia stays front of mind for when, you know, businesses are ready to, to continue planning and, and booking. The planning's happening, like I've said, but it's the booking that we yeah. really want to be making sure um, I'm going to do a slight spin on that question um, because somebody sent us through some information quite interestingly um, that they've surveyed a very large group of their associations who are members uh, and the response from many of them is that they won't be holding conferences until there's a vaccine simply because of the liability and insurance issues that might apply. And therefore, you know, even domestically, we might not be seeing a great willingness until sort of September next year. Um, I'm interested, Peter, in, in what your response would be to that. Is that something you're hearing and seeing in the market? And how do you put in place a contingency for that sort of thing? Yeah, look, I'm, I suppose there are elements of that that you're hearing in the marketplace. And I think this is going to be, in our case, a bit of a short steps process. Um, um, you know, I suppose you look at the matrix of decision from a decision-making perspective and there's things like... Uh, you know, there's there's safety, obviously, and then there's the there's the content, and then there's the legacies, and then there's the experience of the delegates. Um, there's the price, um, the destination. They, these are all, I guess, if you put in a matrix, and I think that matrix of decision making is going to change from what it was, um, and it's going to be a 
done on a on an individual basis i think it depending on what that particular association or that particular conference is looking to achieve so it's i don't think there's one case fits all application here and i think we have to accept the fact that we're going to we're going to have to build confidence and prove that as a as an industry we can provide safe controlled um face to face meetings um and um in this case i think we've just got to pick pick people who are willing to work with us and start to build that confidence because yeah there, there'll be people out there exactly like that who'll say we, we're not going to we're not going to meet anywhere until you've got a vaccine and and that's you know if that's the attitude that they're going to take then you're not going to be able to change that until you get a vaccine so so i think it's going to be very much a case of specific um, needs of, of events and uh what they're trying to achieve and then how we how we work the mix to allow them to to achieve it to the best best of their abilities but i, I don't think we're going to get anywhere you know uh the, the numbers of people attending some of these conferences is going to is going to drop um, but there will be a an additional hybrid or, or virtual aspect to them so you know their overall numbers attending these conferences may may stay the same or may even grow but I don't think uh, in the, the incentive markets work yeah. in China where they do the wave cycles. Now there's a, yeah. you know, a lot of factors to consider yeah. there. There will be some different approaches for sure. Yeah. And I think um, for those associations or industry associations where you think about the global meetings or even their national meetings are a big revenue driver. So how are they going to monetize the online component to be sustainable, financially sustainable in the future? I think that's for something for our industry to think about how we can help contribute, find solutions to that. Yeah. Mm. And interestingly, we've got another question here um, from the lovely Karen Bollinger. Welcome, Karen. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, asking about um, China and, um, you know, uh, China is obviously gearing back up. Um, they're into the selling process again. They're still going to use travel as an incentive, as you rightly pointed out, Penny. Um, how are we going to position ourselves in that hugely contested market? And is this the moment for us perhaps to be saying, and I'll understand if you don't want to answer this aspect of it, Penny, is this the moment to be actually talking to government, despite how bad the finances might be looking, for some real stimulus and capacity to fight the good fight in that China market? Lynn, what, what, what do you think? Oh, um, I think the bid fund helps. I definitely think the bid fund helps and it will help. It, it'll be heightened. There, there is no doubt. Um, but then you think about it, they're, they're corporations and they're still making money. And so their situation hasn't changed. It's the, it's the health and the hygiene and the risk factor for them. So I think for Australia, we've managed this health and economic crisis better than most in the world. If you think the only others like Miss South Korea and Taiwan, and if our competitors are Europe and US, I think we're way ahead of the game. If we can get those protocols um, and get the industry, government and the health officials together to ensure that we're putting out the, the message together, it gives people confidence that we're managing and will have their interests um, at heart. I think it's all about the relationships in China and, and trust and confidence. And I think we're in a pretty good position um, if those borders open to us first. And obviously federal government and what Penny and the team do are absolutely um, critical to all of us and, and Australia's success in that market. Thanks, Penny. Your thoughts on what, what you're seeing in China? I know you touched on it before. Yes, look, they're, they're returning to normal. The only thing that there's not even social distancing happening there. There's temperature checks in and out of buildings. Mm. But otherwise, them meetings, they are the one market where the meetings um, of the world are returning. So, look, relationships are critical. And um, the team that we have there are, are constantly checking in without you know overdoing it um, there's appetite for us to be doing our distribution activity which um, we're mindful of because again you know the borders aren't open and not all of our Australian industry can participate so um, but no we, we will um, you know be looking at our ongoing budgets the minister is unbelievably supportive as is the PM in regards to what Australia will need to do from a tourism perspective to reignite the market and look at that recovery opportunity across all areas. So yeah, KB, I'll keep you updated. 
<laughs> <laughs> so Peter, what are you what are you seeing from China and how you know, do you think this is one of those opportunities for us to start that relationship building with China again? Um, China um, is, a, is going to be very difficult. I think um, I, I, th I would think they see themselves as being uh, as an opportunity to start to attract international events to China. Um, and this is why I think it's going to add enormously to the competitive nature of the marketplace because um, they've been very domestically orientated. Um, they just started to probably six months ago, I reckon I started to see some some action that they were um, starting to broaden their their links internationally with a with a desire to open up some of their market to international conferences and attracting those sort of things. So um, I think they will pro probably see this as an opportunity um, to open their their business events market to the rest of the world, which is a danger for us. Um, you know, attracting the Chinese business events industry to Australia. Um, whilst it's relatively immature, it's growing pretty quickly. I um, mean, that's, that's, a, that's a whole new challenge. And um, I mean, outside of the incentive market, you know, getting corporate um, business into Australia from, from China is, is difficult. Um, so I, look, I think it's, as I say, there's a lot of partnerships that are available. Um, it'd be good if our federal government had a bit, uh, a bit better relationship with the Chinese mm -hmm. political world, I think. But um, yeah, I, I think all it's do, all it's going to do is create an even more competitive landscape than we currently find ourselves in now. Mm, okay, so let me ask you a question that's not China related. Um, you know, we've all been engaging what is probably a, a, one of the the world's <laughs> largest social experiments, which is the working from home issue. Uh, and so many of us uh, have worked from home, and you know job seems to get done reasonably well and at this point in time we don't have a clear picture of how the wider corporate business community is going to respond to people traveling and attending conferences mm -hmm. when doing it this way seems to have worked for a lot of businesses over the last two or three months what what sort of sensation do you have um and i might come back to you again peter on this that the about the business communities. Uh, willingness to come back to the same levels of traveling and engaging in the kind of conferences we've traditionally had? Um, look, unfortunately, I probably see it at the moment. It's a slow burn. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've never worked um, from home um, a lot of the time, but um, there's elements of this that I'm really enjoying, I must say. <laughs> so uh, it's not a good message to uh, the face to face communication. And, and, and look, I think we've got to be careful as an industry because we, we're very good at talking to ourselves and we're very good at talking to the fact that we, we tell each other what we want to hear a lot. And I think we've, we're all propagating the fact that people need to come together and they, you know, face to face is, is, is so important for, for us personally. And, 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 I, and I, I agree with that, but I think um, this has certainly changed people's perceptions a bit. And I think um, there'll be an element of, of the population who are quite satisfied with what they're in, um, what they're finding in the in this way of working at the moment, and they maybe won't be going back too quickly. So, um, and so I keep talking about this confidence. We've we've got to we've got to find really significant reasons for people to get together face to face and to to really um, push that because. I don't think this is going to change uh, for quite some time. You know, not, people, I don't think people are going to be pouring back into the buildings um, in the short term. I think it's going to take quite a while to, to yeah. rebuild that confidence. But when, when that does start to rebuild and, you know, I think, uh, you know, we're such an adaptable bunch. And I mentioned it before about the business event industry, but I think Oz in general. And, you know, we've done the right thing, we've stayed at home and then, you know, there is going to be this different phasing and the returning to work. And as we adjust to that and the um, protocols around all of that, I do think there will be an appetite for people to connect again. And look, from um, our point of view at Tourism Australia within the business events team, we're looking to do some more domestic marketing um, with the event here this year campaign, but we'll work really hard at connecting with the corporate decision makers to almost get that Aussie spirit, um, you know, ignited or reignited to say, come on, there's some duty to your country here. Let's get out and about and meet and that'll help the bushfire regions and all of the um, Australian cities and so on. So we'll work on a plan with that, but also 
reminding everybody what amazing things there are to do um, and what amazing business events, facilities and experiences we have. So we'll also do some work there. Um, but yeah, just time and time, I keep saying this, Pip Harrison says it often too, time and time. And, um, you know, if you keep those sensitivities in mind, I think there will be um, the right time that we can go ahead and, and remind everybody to get out and about. Thank you. We, we are social animals, aren't we? And we, and we do yeah. need to be gathering. Yeah, we're kind of loving this hibernation, but at the same yeah. time, as soon as we are able to get out and about, we'll go, oh, gosh, I miss this. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon Pete's got um, slippers on under that desk. He probably has. Uggies. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about the slippers. It's what's above the slippers that you should be oh, worried uh, about. You're seriously not going there. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> Uh, is there anything you'd like to add at this point, Lynn? Possibly not about what were you wearing on your feet or anywhere else. <laughs> uh, I, look, I think it's going to be, um, we're going to bounce back within our own states first and foremost. I think the airlines have a lot of work to do to give people confidence that, um, you know, consumers want to get back on planes. In terms of the corporates, I think, you know, they've seen that they can um, release some of their expense line through travel. The, I don't think people will be jumping on flights uh, just for one appointment. I think, you know, there'll be real thought behind the trips that they take and that's going to have an impact. You know, you know, Sydney and Melbourne route is the second busiest in the world. Um, wonder what impact that will have because that's predominantly, you know, corporate travel. So it will be interesting how the corporates bounce back. But essentially, I think it's going to be interstate until the airlines come back and then people will gain confidence through the hygiene factors and the, how they go about the distancing, I'm not sure. Well, can I say to all of you, thank you so much for joining us this morning and to all of our attendees, but can I also say thank you to the three of you for the amazing job you're doing and I know you will be fighting the good fight on behalf of the industry and innovating like there's no tomorrow and promoting all of the opportunities here in Australia and for that we thank you. so. Um, I'm sure everybody out there as attendees is madly clapping at this point in time. Um, but allow me to say thank you. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful, wonderful day. And we look forward to um, communicating with you all very soon in another TTF Insights. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Margie. Margie. Thank you.